Hello everyone and welcome back to Code with Italians. Today uh, we have a very special guest, uh, Chuck. Hi Chuck, welcome. Hello, hello. How are you guys doing today? Ah, we're doing, uh, well, I'm doing great because it's the end of the work day. So perfect. And uh, not yeah, yeah, as lucky as, uh, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, just a start for you, I guess. But yeah, Chuck, why are you here today? Uh, yeah, we're here to talk about Compose. Compose. Um, I, 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 I was, was one, one of the, the first three members, members of the Compose, Compose team, team. Uh, uh, with, uh, with Jim and Leland. And uh, we, I wrote most, most of the runtime, including the Composer and Snapshot system. Um, and so I can ask, answer any questions about how Compose works internally, at least from the Composer standpoint. Um, so what you actually interact with when you first start writing is really composition and uh, later then it gets laid out and drawn, but but composition is the very first start. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, and that's, nice. so sort can of answer any questions about that and we can, we can start with uh, snapshots if you like, and we can go and see yeah. how those work. Yeah, we have some uh, questions on our uh, Slido. Uh, people, more, you're more than welcome to put questions on the chat or in the Slido. If there's too many questions in the chat at some point, the Slido will take preference just because it's easier for people to upvote questions there. So um, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. pretty excited because I'll be honest, Chuck, I understand how Compose works as a black box, but not really, <laughs> really. Like I've seen a couple well, of Leland's talks about yeah, the slot the, the table. Yeah, one thing that we try to do that. is is <laughs> is to make it so you can be successful without knowing a lot of these details. And thank you. The focus we had was you should have a mental model where you just write the code and it works, um, and it works kind of the way you want it to work. And how it actually gets from A to B shouldn't be as important, um, and you shouldn't have to hold it in your head. Uh, one of the things I've always found where simplicity is reducing the number of concepts you have in your head um, and that you have to maintain. And that was really the focus we had. You should just basically not think about it or not have to think about it. Now, these are interesting details. We can talk about how it works, but this is not something you need to know. Um, it just, yeah, you know, absolutely. Like, it's basically trivia. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm, Wondering mostly because I'm curious. It's not like, as you said, and I think if yeah, you exactly. folks have done a great job at that, where as a user, I don't need to care almost ever, which is great. It's perfect. But I'm still, I still want to know how things work. I'm the, you know, the kind of kid that you, you give them uh, some toy and they disassemble it to see how it works inside. That, that's <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 So the same way. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Um, before we get started, there is uh, even, you have to do the even thing. <laughs> yeah, oh, so, okay, let's do the even thing. So I want to uh, thank you uh, to everybody, every our supporters uh, on, on Twitch and on Coffee. Uh, thank you for uh, keep putting uh, your, <laughs> well, effort in renewing uh, your subscription uh, on Twitch. If you have an Amazon Prime subscription, I remember you that uh, it's for free. You can uh, connect your Twitch account and your Amazon account, and then you will be able to support us for free. Um, on Coffee, we have like um, uh, like a handful of tiers um, that you can you can join as a subscriber or a one shot um, sub uh, donation. Um, we also have a have a um, a store, a, a shop where you can buy things like. The T-shirt, or we you can buy things like the the, the stickers uh, that we have um, stickers that you can also win um, because we are running a giveaways um, on every episode. Basically, if you are um, a subscriber, you can also win uh, the holo sticker that you can only uh, win if you are a subscriber plus a bunch of other stickers that you will get for free and like you know the IntelliJ stuff that you know we have we have a few friends at the uh, JetBrains so we have stickers for everybody um and this is pretty much it thank you I for think, uh, for being I with us I think there's one more thing as they say <laughs> one more thing one, one more thing, thing. So I, you're, you're talking about uh, stickers and I'm like 
Yes. We have new stickers. <laughs> Yay! We, we have, have new stickers. stickers. And uh, so, maybe you maybe you can show them. Uh, otherwise, I can. So, <laughs> so but I, I'm I, I, like I love stickers. So I'm super excited about this. <laughs> so you pr you probably you probably uh, see my microphone in the stream, and you will yep. notice that we have I have another sticker here because well we built we built the, the Italian. The Italian sticker. I mean, it doesn't get more Italian than this. So you can have this. Uh, you can find them on our uh, coffee store. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's the same deal that we have with uh, with the Angry Pizza stickers. Um, you can buy a handful of them, and we can just ship them with air mail. So it's the cheapest shipping solution that we have. Uh, but you can you can have uh, the pinched pinched fingers emoji or this. on your laptop. You can also have uh, well any can, can can they also have the other one? Yes, they can have all of them, all of them. Because I I like stickers, but I also want to share stickers with people. So <laughs> so if you are like a hardcore uh, follower you can also can have this one so this is this is the the, the new uh, bunch of stickers that we have and we also have last one <laughs> let me show you we also have this one i don't know if you can see them but they are like gluey bubbly 3d version of the angry pizza one so these are very cool these are very <laughs> cool so if you if you want to support the channel and get some sticker that is uh pretty 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 cool uh, just head to our coffee page and um as usual everything that we get from you money wise is gonna be used to buy more stickers um more um goes into the goal we reached the first goal last year so we hired a designer to work on the app our current goal is uh buying more swag like t-shirts and and hoodies and pillows to give away also that so everything that you put in is coming back to you some way uh, with giveaways so this is it. Sorry for getting too much time, but it's important also to to celebrate uh, the the new the new products. And let's let's run. Let's yes. go with it. Just point so. out that I just put in the chat there is a new sticker for subscribers. So if you like spike, <laughs> now you have a spike emoji. The drawing so. is courtesy of our dear friend Virginia Poltrak, who is a very very talented. Uh, artist and she's also the person that makes the Android Studio splash screens. So seems on topic, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. That's, okay. It's great. Well, too many new things. Sorry, sorry, Chuck. Let's get started. I, oh, I need to great. know all the okay. things. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we warmed up everybody at every level, uh, let's start with the first question, Sebastiano. What do we want to start with? Uh, so let's see, um, there's no upvotes for now on the Slido. So let's start with maybe the first one that was asked, which is, mm -hmm. uh, if it's safe to update a mutable state in a launched effect on the IO dispatchers, uh, do other threads see the update? Is it safe to read the state in a composable? So the, uh. The answer to every question in computer science is it depends. Um, <laughs> the, I like the, you so much, Chuck. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so the answer is: is it safe? Is it? It, it depends what you mean by safe. Um, when it comes down to, can you write to it, and will the will the answer be visible to composition? The answer is yes. You can arbitrarily write to it, but the the, the way the snapshot system works is that. Um, you, you trade off availability for consistency. And so what when you write to something in a background thread, it means that when you write, if you write two, two, two snapshot values in a row, let's say you write to A and then you write to B, there's no guarantee that you'll see both A and B together. Um, you might see A first and then B. Um, but the snapshot system allows you to create a snapshot that then 
when you modify A and B, you can then apply the snapshot and then both A and B are seen together. So it's certainly safe to write it in a background thread, but I would prefer that you actually started a snapshot in the background thread um, and then wrote the changes and then applied the snapshot. So then you can get consistency between your writes. So you'll never see you know, A and B modified separately. You will see them as an atomic update. And so when the change happens, then uh, the change will be sent to the recomposer um, and then the recomposer will schedule a composition on the next uh, on the next choreographer frame. So essentially the next frame that you see on the screen will contain your changes. Um, and that, that happens automatically. You don't have to worry about that. Once you do the change, even if with or without a snapshot, the change will eventually make it to the screen and, and probably the next frame. It depends, it might make it, two frames later if the frame has already started uh, composition. So you might not see it on, on the next drawing, you might see it two frames later. Mm, so it might look a bit bad in a way, or if if the changes cause some long running effect like an animation, you might do something weird because it doesn't get everything at the, at the start. Well, it, it'll see, the one thing that we do with this, with con, I mean, this gets to the point of consistency. The reason why the snapshots were created beginning to begin with were two two primary goals. One was observability. So once you make a change, how do we know that you made the change and what gets updated on the screen depending upon the change you made? The other one was consistency. So once snapshot, once the once composition starts, we take a snapshot. That means any changes that happen in global or any threads are not visible within that within that composition until it's until it's complete. And so once you start composition, we have essentially frozen all the data from the perspective of composition and then compose based upon that snapshot. And what that means is that if you if you do things inside of sub snapshots or if you make changes, we have a consistent slice through all the data that will be shown on the screen um, as consistent. Um, and then when the next composition cycle starts, we take another snapshot and we are consistent with that snapshot. So we're always consistent. So even if you're making changes to multiple pieces of data, um, we have one point in time that we take a snapshot and we then essentially draw that snapshot onto the screen. Um, and if the data is changing, you will see the old version of the data, not the new version of the data. Um, this is really important when you're talking about updating uh, data that must be consistent with itself. So, for example, if you're summing something, you know, you're summing the rows and columns, you want the sum to be the sum of what you're showing, not some previous or not some future state. Um, and you can imagine if you're changing the values out from under composition, you might get the wrong sum at the end. We might be displaying one value. Um, someplace in the composition and another value in a different place in the composition. Snapshots allow us to basically freeze all that and say at the beginning of composition, that's the value of everything that we're going to compose with. Um, animations, and to bring up your point for animations, animations are ticking between the frames. So, so essentially, you know, even if you start a long-term or a long animation, it doesn't, uh, snapshots won't affect that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, um, the animations will use snapshots internally to, like when you do a, uh, a an animated value, what you're doing is essentially animating a, uh, a snapshot value mm -hmm. over time. And then we will be observing the changes of that value and recompose whenever that value changes. And that's what essentially triggers off the animation. Now, every part in Compose actually will also observe mutable st a mutable state um, so if it's only observed inside of layout, then only layout gets invalidated. If it's only observed inside of drawing, then only drawing will get invalidated. Um, and so if you sometimes you're, you'll have an animation that's only moving things in the screen. It's only uh, changing its layout position. Well, only layout and draw will be uh, uh, invalidated at that point, and the composition won't be because it's not observing that value. But the, this this snapshot approach allows us to be consistent throughout the process of, from the from when it starts to all the way to the end of when it lands on the screen, we have a consistent picture 
of what the state was at the beginning of composition. Does that make Good. sense? Yeah. 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 So you mentioned that um, you you like the the idea behind snapshots is, is that you can take multiple uh, different pieces of data that might not be consistent between each other in terms of timing and put them together in a consistent state that makes eventually yeah, it's, it, it it appeals back to time. It says at this point in time, mm -hmm. all the values were were at this point. Um, and so what you're not observing is the values changing while composition is happening. So mm -hmm. you won't get, you know, if you read value A at the beginning of composition and then later read it, the value A at the near the end of composition, you get the same value, even if A is right. changing. Right, right, right. So even if you're in the process of re getting a read back from uh, the database or you're re getting a, a, a web request result back, you end up writing it to the mutable state object and you're thinking, well, what if composition is happening now and can I write to this object safely mm. and will it damage anything in composition? And the answer is if it's mutable state, no, because we don't actually see those changes uh, while we're composing because we have a separate snapshot that we're looking at. Um, and so essentially what we do is just, we take a snapshot and everything from composition's perspective is read only um, for all of that data and we, we read it and then we compose. Um, and, or, or as we're composing, we'll read the data and then react to it. So from a user's perspective, it's as if you were doing a discrete sampling over, on time. So every, yeah, exactly. uh, every exactly frame what or whatever. Yeah, it's an, exactly like a discrete sampling. We basically, you can think of it as what we do is we look at it and we make a copy of everything that we, we're going to read and then we, we compose using that copy. Now, doing literally a copy would be expensive. Um, so what we do, what snapshots do is they use approach called copy on write. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you make a change to a value, we actually copy the value and then change it. We produce it into a copy of the original value. And then all of the previous values can be found. Now I, we could probably go into the slide deck that uh, the first mm -hmm. slide that I had kind of gives an, an idea of how this works internally. And we can look at um, what this does is it has two objects, A and B. Um, I'm very creative in my names, obviously. Um, the, uh, the first mutable state object um, just is a mutable state of integer, and you've changed it into, you you've initially had a value of one, and, an initial, and a, then you change it to 15. And the B was the initial value of seven, and then somehow you increment it to eight. Um, and now if you just you click to the next, um, we'll see what, what happens when you're looking at this from, from different snapshots. Let's say you, at time tick five, um, the way that snapshots work is we have a monotonically increasing number, which is we use mm -hmm. the ID. It just always goes up. It never goes down. Um, and so whenever you create a new snapshot, you get a new number. Um, and that's, that's, that's essentially what creating a snapshot is, is you get a snapshot ID. Um, from the snapshot five, the values, you can look at it and you can say, well, what the values are one and five, one and seven at snapshot five. And the reason is because anything older than the snapshot ID is ignored from that value perspective. Anything older than the snapshot ID was created after the snapshot started. So we ignore it. Mm. Right? And then what we do is we select the oldest value that is that we're not ignoring. Right? And that's that's essentially what okay. what we what we do with the snapshot. So we, at snapshot five, you'll see that you know one and seven match that criteria because five, uh, four is less than five and three is less than five, but seven is not less than five and twenty five is not less than five. So we ignore both of those. Okay. Um, at, at snapshot sixteen, however, we're now seeing that the value fifteen is visible because seven seven is is less than sixteen. But 25 is not, so we still see seven. And at 30, uh, we see uh, both of the, the the modifications. We see at snapshot 30, we see 15 and, six, and eight. At any point during this process, you can, if you have five, six, 16, and 30 available to you, you could read those values. You can get what the values of those objects are at that point in time. Now, from the Compositions perspective, let's say that we started composition at 16 and then some modification happened 
uh, in 30 while composition was happening, we're still going to read B as 7, even though you changed it to 8. We will display it in that composition as 7. Then the next composition will happen, and then it will appear as 8. Right? So, so we ignore all changes while composition is happening. We kind of re we don't That's exactly happening. ignore them. We record them. We say, OK, this change happened, but we are not using it yet. And then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and process that later. So when you um, uh, when you get a change during a composition, what happens is that that snapshot get like you write the fact that the value that you keep that you're holding at a, as a state has changed, and then you note, oh, I need to uh, recompose the the things that depend on the state that has changed. Correct. Yeah, there's a there's a slide I think a little bit further that goes into I think that's the last slide in the deck that I added. Um, we can go into that one. Sure. Um, this, this is one? Uh, yeah, that's yeah about changes how changes work. So just start the animation there. Um, so this is the guy, the kind of thing. Let's say you have a uh, the recompose scope at the bottom, which just uses value, which is the mutable state that we have. This mm -hmm. is the one in fifteen value. Um, so let's you know go to the next thing. That what happens is we start. In snapshot 30, we're, we're just going to make a change. Um, so we make this change, uh, hit the next uh, next part of the animation. Yep. Then what happens is a state record gets, you know, the, the state record gets added to the list of mutable state uh, records. Um, and with the ID 30 and saying, okay, this is the valid value for 30. And now the snapshot itself takes a reference to the mutable state. It didn't actually know about the mutable state object until you changed it. And it has a list of them. Now, when the snapshot applies, then the recomposer is listening to applications. So to hit the space bar again. And so it gets notified about the list. It says, oh, this value changed. The next thing the composer does, recomposer does is at the next start of the next frame, it sends the all the composers the list of objects that have changed. So mm -hmm. here's the list of objects that changed in the last, last time I told you about them. Um, and then if you click through here, the recomposer will get the, the, or the composition will get the change. It will then find the recompose scope associated with that change. In other words, the, the recompose scope that read that value, it will then say, ah, you need to recompose. And that's the last step. And uh, that's the recomposition then creates, change, creates the change, updates the value to 25 or recomposes with that value of 25. And that will then trigger off all the relayout and drawing that's associated with uh, that change appearing on the screen. Um, and that's essentially how, how things work. And then the final step is when, you, when that's all done, uh, you can click the final thing. And what happens is that um, the snapshot goes away. It's, it's completely gone. There's no, now there's no reference from the snapshot system's perspective back to the mutable state object. Um, that mutable state object is forgotten essentially by snap by the snapshot system until you change it, mm. and that's an important important concept. You can it, it's it's important for garbage collection. It's that mutable state objects are just normal objects as far as garbage collection goes. Uh, you stop referring to them, they get collected. Um, at no point does the snapshot system need to know that they they got collected. Um, they can just go away, and uh, and. Also, when we create a snapshot, all we're doing is creating a new ID that's greater than the previous one. We don't have to notify any of the mutable state objects that that happened. Mm -hmm. um, so you can create snapshots arbitrarily. It's only when you go to read the value, which you already have a reference to the mutable state object then, or if you write the value, which you also have a reference to the mutable state object. And when you write, that's when the, the, the snapshot takes a reference to the object that you need to modified so that it can send to in this example the recomposer so you yeah. can you can forget about the um, the snapshot and the mutable state uh, that are not used anymore because you know that when it comes to uh, using the new values like you don't care about stuff that hasn't changed since the last snapshot because you're only recomposing things that depend on the new values right. or yeah, so the, I mean, the uh, the composition has a reference to the mutable state object, but the snapshot system does not. Um, mm, so the, the okay. composition is that when you use the value, it says, I've read it. Um, the recompose scope will maintain a reference to the object that that it read. Um, so when the recomposer sends it a list of objects, it knows, oh, this is the recompose scope that needs to be invalidated. Um, so the, the composition maintains a reference to everything that it read. 
but the snapshot does not. So snapshots are completely independent of composition. Um, in fact, the way it's written is that snapshots are completely independent of everything else in Compose. Um, and everything is kind of built on top of snapshots as a fundamental principle. Um, and then the recomposer will hook into the snapshot system for notifications. And then also the recomposer maintains this uh, heartbeat um, of it, it will watch the for re the for changes to objects and then will schedule a what's called a uh, send apply notifications and so when send apply notifications happens that's when the notification from the snapshot goes to the recomposer um, and then that's when it kicks off everything else for scheduling the next frame so there's this heartbeat going on that anytime you make a global change we will then record the fact that some global change happened. So later we will process that global, that global change and cause a snapshot to it to, we call the, the global snapshot will advance. Now, if you go back a couple of slides, the, I think it's the third slide. Um, uh, yeah, the third slide, not that one. Uh, yeah, this, this is the one that, uh, th this shows kind of what happens with a, so the global snapshot is the one that's running in the background. It's it's essentially it is the snapshot that all snapshots are derived from eventually. And it's where the snapshot goes uh, when you make a change. So in this case, we have snapshot 32 that's made a change. Um, uh, well, it, it didn't actually make a change, but it, uh, it had um, imagine that I had constructed this, this slide correctly and the value was two instead of one. <laughs> um, the uh, when it when when the snapshot ID then commits, it will commit that record back into global and then that record will actually be seen by, by global. Um, so anybody who creates a new snapshot or reads it in the global snapshot will see the new value. Mm -hmm. um, and so you think of the snapshots, there's, a, there's always the global snapshot and the snapshot will then uh, branch off. Um, and this is where the trade-off between consistency and availability goes, is that whenever the global snapshot you're seeing in the global snapshot, you see the change immediately as it happens. So you always see when you're in a snapshot, you always see the changes that happen in that snapshot immediately. So all threads that are in global will always see the global change. If you don't want the changes to appear on global, then you can create a mutable snapshot like 32 here, make the change isolated from global. And then when you want everyone to see them, you apply those changes and now everyone will see all of those changes at once. So, but it looks like Git, so I mean- Yeah, I was I'm thinking guessing. the same. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, Git it, is, is, made, is, is kind of the same process. I mean, this is not, this is not something fundamentally, uh, you know, fundamentally, uh, innovative on my approach. I mean, this is this is the approach that, for example, databases have used for quite a long time, starting with Interbase um, at Borland when I was there. Um, and then the then it was adopted by Oracle. It's basically snapshot consistency within a database. It's just applied to a UI. And so it's, it, it operates exactly like this. The process that I'm describing is called uh, multi-version concurrency control. Um, you can look it up on on the on Wikipedia, it's a really good article on Wikipedia that describes what how multiversion concurrency control works, uh, and this is essentially the same thing. Um, it's just multiversion concurrency control in memory instead of on a database. You you said something a couple of times that it it, it put me a bit off about somebody creates a, a snapshot. Can you elaborate on that? Because is it I mean, what do you mean when you say if somebody creates a, a snapshot? I is it not something that it's like just magically, magically happening and nobody can touch it? Or uh, who's creating uh, snapshots? <laughs> now, I don't okay, know, I'm so serious the, because you know. Yeah, no, yeah, th th uh, it's a good point that I kind of glossed over uh, <laughs> because from my perspective, I you know, it's whoever calls take snapshot. Um, is the person creating the snapshot? But the uh, essentially works. The snapshots are created implicitly for you during composition. That's the the main 
creator of a snapshot is that when you're running in composition, you're actually running inside of a snapshot created by the, the composition system. And every time you're doing, you're doing composition and you're running, you're actually in a snapshot that's isolated from goal. Um, and then okay. all changes you make in that snapshot will only be visible once composition is applied. So once you've applied okay. composition, then all the changes you made during composition are also are then uh, also seen. Uh, but until then, nothing nothing's seen in global. Um, you can also create a composition or a snapshot directly by snapshot dot take uh, take mutable snapshot or take snapshot. If you say take snapshot, you get a read only snapshot, so you can't make any changes within that snapshot. But no objects within that snapshot can be changed even by you. Okay. Um, take mutable snapshot is exactly what you'd expect. It's, it takes a snapshot. You can then make changes within that snapshot. Um, and then the, nothing will, nobody will see those changes but you until you commit or apply the, the snapshot. Um, now, I I've sometimes slip and use the word commit. Commit is what you would do on a database. Um, we use the term snapshot instead of transaction. We initially used the term transaction, but Transaction is, implies ACID, uh, which is you know accessible, uh, concurrent, or consistent, isolated, and durable. We're not durable. Um, we're atomic, we're consistent, and we're isolated, but we're not durable. And so I didn't want to use the term transaction, and so we use the term snapshot. Snapshot also is a good idea of what kind of consistency model you get. You don't get serializable consistency, you get snapshot consistency. And so if you look in the in the database terminology for what snapshot consistency is, there are some issues you would need to deal with with write skew, but other than that, it's it's exactly a snapshot consistency. Um, and so it's very clear about what model of consistency that I'm providing. Um, and when I'm talking about consistency, usually consistency is between two objects when you write, two independent objects. Do you see changes made to those two objects at the same time, or do you see them independently? Um, if some objects are fine being independent, like you know the left, or the horizontal and vertical scroll bars are completely fine being independent values. Um, but if you're talking about, oh, I want the parallax to be consistent with the horizontal scroll bar, well, those better be in a snapshot. Otherwise you'll get uh, deviations between the parallax and the value of the scroll bar, for example. And so that'd be consistent. And we make, in composition, we just basically take all of those worries away from you from perspective by saying, okay, it's consistent because at a point in time we sample equivalent um, and then we'll always be consistent. We'll never see two values that are different, that are inconsistent with each other as long as you have written them in a consistent fashion. So something like uh, derived state of, does that influence okay. the way the snapshot is created? No, the derived state of is basically saying that it's it's basically what derived state of is saying that there are some reads or there's a function essentially that you want to execute that will produce a value based upon other reads. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to do that lazily. I, and I want to do that consistently. So I want the value to be, the, the, the result of the expression to be the values as they occur within the snapshot. But if the values haven't changed, I just give me what the previous value was. And so it's like a, it's like a memoization within the context of a snake, snapshot. Um, and so if you're in a snapshot and I know that all the values you read are the same as what you read last time, I can just return you back the value that you had last time. I don't have to run the function. But if I know any of them are different, then I go ahead and run the function again and produce a new value and then remember that. Um, Got it. Within this direct state. It just means that if there's some calculation that is expensive, that that is that it uses a lot of different uh, mutable state objects, you want to make sure that that object, that calculation, only done when it's needed. And so what we do is we essentially observe all the reads done within that lambda, and if any object that you've read during that lambda uh, changes, then we will we will then mark the the derived state object as as invalid for that snapshot, um, and then when you go to read it it will produce a new value within that snapshot. Got it. So you've kind of answered my follow-up as well, which is then why don't we have to use uh, <laughs> uh, derived state of all the time? Because for non-expensive operations, the memoization is more expensive 
than yeah, you know, right. The mobilization is more expensive than the operation. It's it's basically a trade off. If you have an operation that's more that's that's more expensive than the calculation, or the calculation more expensive than just than the cost of memoization, then you should you should memoize in this case. So uh, the other thing that we do is that composition observes derived state up differently than it observes normal uh, state objects. Uh, the derived state object, um, when you're doing composition, it will watch the derived state object uh, and treat it as a, a, it won't remember the objects that the derived state object read. It only remembers the derived state object. Um, and then when an object comes in, it will ask the derived state objects that it's watching to see if they read this object. Um, if they have, then it conditionally invalidates the composition at that location. And what I mean by that is that it's invalid. We will go to that location within the composition, but then at the point of that composition, we will then reevaluate all the derived state objects to see if any of them changed. If they haven't, we skip. We just say, okay, well, you didn't change anything in this composition, and therefore we don't, we don't execute it. And so that's a different way of, of observing the composition than a normal, a normal object. This means you can do things like have a Boolean value uh, watching a different, a different derived state object and say, well, I want to know, I want this, this value is true or false, but that, that value you're reading might change a lot. Like uh, one example is the scroll bar position, like that value might be changing a lot. Um, and you don't want to invalidate the composition every time the scroll bar changes. You only want to invalidate the composition at this location when some Boolean condition changes from true to false. Well, derive state of allows you to put a buffer in between the rate of change of the original value and the rate of change of the result. And so you basically are only invalidating the composition at the rate of change of the result of the expression and not the mm -hmm. original values that are being read. And then I guess that would also, like if you have two numbers and one goes up by one, the other one goes down by one, and you're using them in a derived state of, you're not going to recompose whatever depends on that result because the end result hasn't changed, correct? Yeah, if you're summing them, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, assuming you're summing them. Yeah, yeah, if you're, if you're producing a sum of those two, then you're right, yeah. If, if, if you have corresponding, and in fact, one of my unit tests does exactly that. <laughs> That's exactly what the unit test is. Um, it adds one and subtracts one and makes sure the composition doesn't get invalidated because of that happen. So, yeah, that's, that's, so derived state of is, is from composition perspective is uh, a way of buffering uh, rate of change um, as well as, as, uh, as doing a, uh, a cache value essentially, or a memoized value outside mm -hmm. of composition derived state of is, is used entirely for the cached value aspect of it and not, not, uh, not the rate of change. Mm -hmm. um, it only makes sense, the rate of change only makes sense in the context of an observer. And so that's the primary observer of mutable state objects is composition. Got it. Ivan, do you have follow-up questions on this? Yeah, no, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I don't know if I'm having a stroke or I just want to go farming, uh, but this is... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Let's let's go to the next question. Shall but even I mean, you just this is... keep keep repeating to yourself. I don't need to care. Like if I get yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah, good. No. If I don't get you it, Chuck has fixed that for I us. Mean, <laughs> you, you you you're kidding? But I mean, Chuck, right now, I you have no idea how much grateful I am that I don't need to know how this shit works <laughs> because this is incredibly beyond my comfort zone you know like my comfort zone is here no this thing is like just no uh so thank you thank you for taking care of this thank you for thinking about the the the, the baby developers that uh, the our industry is, <laughs> is, is full of and yeah i mean this thing is yeah I've been, thinking, I've been thinking about uh how how Frameworks should work for a long time. I, uh, the first framework I wrote was actually a text mode framework. Um, it, it, TurboVision, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Turbo Pascal, but uh, TurboVision was my Turbo first Pascal, framework. Wow. And then I then I worked at Borland uh, for like 17 years and did three frameworks for them. Uh, TurboVision, uh, OWL, which is the object windows library, and then the VCL, which is the 
the visual component library that went into Delphi. Um, and so I, I worked on those and then I went to Microsoft and worked on WPF um, and worked okay. on some of the fundamental designs of how it worked. Um, and then learned all of the, I mean, it, every time you do a framework, you, were, you learn about the mistakes that you made in the previous framework. Um, and so you accumulate all of those. Um, and so Compose is basically an expression of trying to create a framework that fixes all the mistakes of all the previous frameworks that I've ever made. Um, and, and the snapshot system is part of that, you know, how do you deal with consistency within a, within a you know, observability and consistency within uh, a UI framework. And that's, that's my, my essentially the, the end result of all of my thinking over the years that, that I've done uh, on frameworks. Um, and, uh, I, I, yeah, I find so it fascinating because we have a, a question about regrets. <laughs> yeah, because you, <laughs> you you mentioned that you know I built a framework and then you start thinking about ah oh, man this thing could be probably better and then you build another framework where that thing is better but but then you probably <laughs> can improve other things. Somebody on on Slido asked uh, any design regrets with Compose? If you could do it all over again, what would you do differently? Uh, well, I haven't had it. It hasn't been around yet for me to learn what I regret. I mean, usually it takes about five to six years for you to really realize that this was wrong nice. because right now you're kind of in love with all the design decisions that you made. Oh, um, nice. So really, right now, I don't, I don't regret it. The only thing that I, you know, I, the only thing that I would say that would be that we would do differently is if there are some features, there's some design or language changes that we wanted to make into. Uh, into Kotlin uh, early on. And we worked with the Kotlin team about some of those. Um, if we had some of those language features, we might've designed certain things differently. Um, but when we're talking about the language we have now, um, this is exactly what we, what we want. Uh, it's exactly the way we should do it. Um, and it fits in with Kotlin today and as opposed to some fictional version of Kotlin in the future. Um, and it, that's one thing that I found that goes hand in hand and was really great working with the Kotlin team uh, when we're doing this is we, uh, at every point where the framework and the language kind of evolve somewhat together, um, you get a better both. You get a better framework and you get a better language. And that's, and what we found is that we were, we were kind of pressuring each other. The Kotlin team was pressuring us to do changes and we were pressuring them to do changes. and. And at the end result, we got, I think, something that's really, really wonderful um, in Compose. And it's, it fundamentally is simple. I mean, we, we've, we have it based upon a function. Um, so, it, so all the things you learned about doing functional decomposition as part of your work um, apply directly to Compose. I mean, anytime you can use a function, you can use a, compos a composable function, and it, it, it just works the way you expect. If you don't have... Uh, some things that are subtle and composed that we we don't talk about a lot because they really come from Co Kotlin and not Compose. But if you compare them to other frameworks, um, I worked on like for example Angular for a long time, and we worked on this concept of trying to minimize the the impact of or the cost of a of a component. And we had all these kind of techniques, um, and uh, we ended up getting one for free, an inline composable function is like, you think, oh, it's an inline function. Of course, it's just inline function from, from, from Kotlin. You get that from Kotlin. But the fact that we chose functions means that we got an inline composable function or a very low cost component for free. And, uh, and that was like, okay, we, we knew we went down the right direction because you can just start using Kotlin features. Like we didn't have to invent a way of doing iteration because we had a for loop. We didn't have to invent a way of, uh, of coming up with an if then statement, uh, which you do in, like for example, Angular has its own sub language to do this kind of thing. It's just part of the language. And so fitting into the language was just revolutionary from our perspective is that just, you just write it like you would a normal function. Um, and you just realize that when I say text, text will magically appear on the screen. And that's, that's all you need to do. And then you describe what you want to appear, not how it gets there. And that's the important aspect of it, is that, is that when a composable function writes uh, runs, you're describing what the result is that you want to show. 
and you don't care about what the result was the previous time it ran, that's up to the runtime to figure out how to get from A to B. Um, and that's essentially the code that I wrote inside the recomposer, which is, or inside the composer, which analyzes the function as it's running, recording all the things that it's doing based upon that was different from the previous one and inserts and deletes nodes and updates property values based upon what you've done, um, all behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, all you're describing is what you want to see. And it's that describing what the end result is, is the most important uh, revolutionary concept that's come in the last uh, five, six years um, in framework design. It's, it's what I would have wanted to do you know, back in my Delphi days or when I, what I wanted to do in, in VCL and, and didn't have essentially the, the knowledge at the time to realize what we were doing uh, was, was not what you should do. And it's like, it's not that we did it wrong. It's just that now I've learned and the industry has made, has made progress and this is the right way to, to write UI. And, and the, the old way is, is, is still works. It's great, but it's, it's not the way I would have done it from scratch. And so when it comes to regrets, I certainly probably will have some in the future, but uh, now I don't, I mean, they're, they're all, they're all the kind of, well, you know, if, if the world had been done differently, I would have done it differently, but that's uh, in the world that we're in now, that's the that composes the right, I believe composes the right way to do it. I mean, I'm not just saying that to, to, to be a good composed person. I actually honestly believe that that's, I mean, I spent four years doing this and I invested um, a lot of my time into producing what I think is the best, uh, is the best framework, so. That's great. Plus, um, anyway, there is so always version number two, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not even if you want to improve things, it's not that you are throwing everything away, right? I I, I strongly well, believe in incremental. We, the one thing we're doing now growth. is that we, we're. I mean, the change we're making now is like we're to, we have some ideas of what we need we want to do for the next step. Like uh, there's. Uh, some next step optimizations that we're working on. There's some next step uh, features. Like one of the features I'm working on now is called uh, movable content. Um, it's the current CL that I'm working on. Um, what it allows you to do is convert a function into a movable content function or movable content Lambda. And what it means is that if you call it in one place in the application and then you like in an if statement, like you say, if uh, in a row I do some content and then else I do a column in some content, the content will move between the two as opposed to being regenerated on the if statement. It will actually, you know, the content will move from the column into the row or from the row into the column. Um, what? And you can obviously what? see that that would have some benefits to doing animations if that animated. And, um, and so a lot of this stuff is like, okay, this is like, how do we actually get that into, how do we get these kinds of transitions into the system? And, and the fundamental thing is, okay, well, we just still use a function. We just make the meaning of calling that function slightly different than we have a normal Lambda. And then we get this thing where you don't have to worry about how things move within a tree, the com composition system will figure it out um, and move things around and you'll get the right result. So um, this... And the important things of the movable content is that, you know, let's say you have an animation playing within the content, you want that to move uh, with the content as it changes, as the layout of the screen changes, you still want the animation to be running uh, glitch free. You don't want it to start in the middle of the animation. You want it to be continue. Well, that's this idea is this, is this content will move. The internal state of the composition will move with the content and, uh, and things will be real nice. So there's, there's things that we're trying to deliver that are just basically logical extensions on what we have today. Um, we want to be able to move the time when composition happens. We're working on ways of, of, essentially moving composition ahead of the frame instead of within the frame. Um, so that, cause if you're, if, if we get composition done, like in, you know, four or five milliseconds uh, in the previous frame, like everything was, you know, you didn't change very much, but you know that there's a big change coming. What do you do? Uh, currently what we do is if a big change comes, we, we discover that at the beginning of the new, the next frame and we take whatever time is necessary to generate that frame, which might, be longer than 16 milliseconds. And if that's the case, you just dropped a frame um, yeah. and, uh, and, you get a, and you get a glitch. If we could then say, well, we have, we have like 12 milliseconds before the next frame starts, 
why don't we just start now? Um, can we do and what we now? can do then Our is we can then do composition before the next frame starts. And then when the frame lands, we actually will then say, okay, now we're, now we'll do the, the rest of it. We'll apply the changes the that we calculated and then we'll actually continue the process of layout and, and, uh, and draw. You can get a little bit of that now. There's a precursor for that now in lazy column and lazy row where lazy column and lazy row will do a uh, pre-composition of the, of the rows and columns um, as they're coming in and out of the frame. Um, it doesn't shift the composition of the, of the, of the rows and columns that are displaying, but it allows, it allows you to pre-compose a frame that is not on the screen yet. Um, and so as you're scrolling, um, because the glitch happens when the new content arrives, right? So you mm -hmm. get a new row that appears at the bottom of the screen as you're scrolling up. Um, and then we have to draw that. We have to compose it and draw it. And so what Lazy Row does is says, okay, well, I will just pre-compose a frame that I believe will be in the next, that you'll, you'll get to eventually. And then it will land that when you actually get to it. Um, and so we have pre-composition now in limited fashion in Lazy Row and Column. And we we're looking at ways to make that a little bit more general purpose where you don't, that's another thing you wouldn't have to worry about. It just would happen. Um, your composition would be called some other time during, during uh, on the main thread, it's still called on the main thread. It's just not called during, during the composer uh, frame. Uh, but from your perspective, it just, things just work better. They don't. They yeah, don't but that's what I, what I, what I'm thinking about. I mean, if you can do something like that, the performance gain, compared to the current view system should be like immense, right? Because, I mean... Well, we, yeah, the way we... The, the first version of Compose was to be competitive with views, right? And and for a first version, we did a really good job. There's a couple of places where we're not quite as competitive as we would like to be. Um, uh, there, There's areas where we need to work on. Uh, but when you came down to the whole system, you compare it, a Compose application to a view application, um, if it's been uh, compiled or AOT, then it's they're, they're really pretty close. They're very, very, very close. Um, and that's with one version one, right? We, we wanted to go version one with competitive views. Um, there are a couple of things we do faster, there's a couple of things we do slower, but generally we're on par with views. The next step is, okay, now we have the system that we have a lot more flexibility than views ever had in how we execute. Can we actually go beyond views? Um, and, and to be it. much faster, which is in this case is what we're talking about pre-composition. We, we've talked about being able to do composition off thread. Um, for now, I'm skeptical of, of thread, multi-threaded composition because of the way Android works internally is that there's really only two primary cores that you're using uh, on most devices. You'll have additional cores, but they're probably low cores or smaller cores. And if you move composition to a small core, you actually slowed down composition. It's usually two times slower. Um, your code's running two times slower than it was. You want composition to be on one of the, the big cores. Um, but yeah. the, the only way you're going to be on the big core is if you're in the main thread. Um, so moving it off thread means you have a chance of actually being on a lower core. So the, the biggest benefit that we think is going to happen is by moving composition within the, you know, trying to figure out where, how we can better utilize the main thread. Uh, which is why we're trying to work on pre-composition first. Um, and that seems like a, and there's other things we can do. We might do where threads really pay off is in this, is, is in navigation scenarios where uh, I have something showing on the screen that has an active animation that I don't want to disturb, right? Um, let's say you have like, you, you know, you're, you're transitioning to a, a big chunk of content um, and you're not ready to display it yet because you don't have all the data and composition hasn't completed yet, you don't want to put that in a frame where everything stops waiting for this composition to, to complete. It would be nice if you could do that off thread. And so those kinds of things are actually beneficial where you're doing a navigation where, where you're going from A to B and you want you, you want the complete A or the complete B to be displayed in a nice transition effect instead of having to have a glitchy effect while it's waiting for these large data items to arrive. And so that's where I think threads would, would pay off more than, than just random composition. Um, so we're looking at things like that. Uh, there's, there's work that needs to be done, but that said, it's like, there's a lot of work I have to do <laughs> between now and there in the runtime. So it's uh, the first, like I said, it's movable content is the first one. Um, 
And that'll, that'll enable a lot of uh, animation effects that we can't do today. And that's, the, I see that as being the, the, uh, the, the next, well, it's the next big feature. It's the one I'm, I should be landing in the next couple of weeks. Um, you can go on to our, our site and look at the CL if you want. Um, I don't have a link to it, but uh, I could, we, it's easily, easily found. Um, and uh, you can see what the, what the progress of that was. Um, the next thing I'll be working on is, is called, um, this is kind of a, if you're following in Twitter, Leland it, uh, it referenced it a little bit as a rib to me. Um, is that we're doing inferencing of targets uh, within composition. Right now you can have a composable function doesn't know what you're going to produce. Uh, it produces a node, uh, a layout node, if you call a layout node producing comp composer, right? Um, and if it'll produce a vector graphic node, if you're in a vector graphic uh, composer, um, we're getting a lot more composers. Plants is gonna be using composition, uh, the, where, the where OS team in, in in general, starting to use composition. Uh, we have other teams within Google that are looking at composition for really interesting things. You have uh, third parties that are using composition for interesting things, like uh, Jake has created Mosaic, uh, which is a text-based. It kind of goes to my heart because, uh, I mean, I did Triple Vision a long time <laughs> ago, uh, text-based UI, and says, oh, right, now Compose can be used for text. Check one of my... <laughs> One of my frameworks have been has been replaced. Um, the uh, so composition for text, uh, but you can't. It doesn't make sense to create a you know a, a compose UI button in the middle of text, right? So, so the compiler should tell you that you're doing it wrong uh, if you if you call a compose UI button inside of a mosaic text uh, UI. So what what the inference does is it looks at the functions you call within a composer and says ah. You're calling text. You must be a UI composable, um, and you're calling this other version of text. You must be a Mosaic composable, and then it tags the function as an attribute, saying, "Oh, your target is this." Um, and then when you use it in the in a different context, it will, the compiler will tell you, "Ah, oh, you're you're calling this in the wrong context. You need to be in this other context." Um, nice. And so that that requires inferencing, uh, uh, which is the one of the next things that I'm I'm going to be landing. Um, that's a big change to the compiler. So, this is all uh, stuff you're targeting for 2.0, or uh, I mean, 1.2 is is the target for movable content, um, oh. and I think that we might be able to get the inferencing in 1.2 as well. So, nice. Wow, that's nice. Nice. Yeah. So well, that, uh, that... we definitely do 1.1.2 .1 is is definitely going to be the the target for uh, the movable content. Um, I've got it working now. It's passing tests. It just needs to be reviewed um, and, and landed. Uh, so there's obviously going to be some changes coming in in the review that I need to take care of. And we landed on a name, which was nice. Um, and uh, and so we're going to go forward with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Afzal has very kindly posted the link to the CL uh, okay, good, for movable yeah, content yeah. and also uh, mentioned the markdown file that explains how it works. Yeah, I put it. Uh, this is something that I'm going, to be, I'm going to start doing for my CLs that are large like this. Uh, we had a design document internally uh, that discussed what, you know, why, how it works, uh, or what the options were to implement this feature, uh, why we need it, uh, what options we have, what problems we're trying to solve. Um, that was, uh, we have an internal design discussion uh, for these kinds of things, and the document represents that. I converted it to Markdown, and I'm going to check it in. Uh, I'll do the same thing with the uh, inferencing uh, big seal that, I, that I'm doing now. Uh, it'll go into the design of how the inferencing works. Uh, this is where the Hin Hindley Milner type system comes in. <laughs> um, the the and so the design system will or the the design document will cover you know what the trade offs are, what the you know the theory behind how the inferencing works. Um, and uh, and if you're and I think I might keep the prologue that I have in there. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys are have ever used prologue in your life, but um, I have not. My, my senior the thesis in college was to writing a prologue interpreter, so that's that was uh, my first experience when I was in college a long time ago. Um, so I, that prologue still has affinity, and there's some things that are easy to write in prologue that are like trivial to write in prologue, but they're difficult to write in other languages. So I, every once in a while, I'll just break out some prologue. <laughs> 
<laughs> just in case. Yeah. Just, yeah, in, you know, just in case. Sure. Otherwise, somebody might understand like, what I'm saying. So if I could write some <laughs> prologue, I can say, yeah, look, this prologue demonstrates it. Um, and everybody goes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's that's clever. That's clever. Um, you know, it's, it's that I, I, I can do, I can write some Haskell for them too, and then that'd be equally geez. like uh, opaque, um, and they'll trust me. Uh, you can you can still write Perl, I guess, if you want to make it right. Yeah, yeah. I wrote I wrote a significant amount of Perl uh, in my life. Uh, we targeted uh, the VCL towards uh, Linux at one point. We had this product called Kylix, um, and I wrote some Perl scripts to convert all of the uh, interfaces that we had, all, all the objects into their C++ equivalents so that you can use it uh, against Qt um, and also translated Qt so you can use it from Pascal. Um, didn't, don't want to do it again. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I have a question uh, about performance. Because you were mentioning the um, CPUs, you know, mostly you are using two. If you switch on a, another core, it probably is going to be slower. Would it make sense to build something like that, but with with Tensor in mind? Like, you know, something like like Apple will do. We are building the piece oh, yeah, yeah. metal. Um, we are also building this thing that is going to shred tires. On this yeah. piece of metal, because well, we had no evidence. Programming on on a tensor. Well, I mean, are you talking about the meaning of tensor? There's a tensor chip that that shipped uh, with uh, yeah. Pixel Six, which is kind of a general purpose yes. chip that also includes um, AI uh, AI stuff. Um, writing general purpose code towards uh, a chip designed to do significant parallel work um, is challenging uh, because you have to code things differently. Um, so it wouldn't just you know run. It would have to. You'd have to really redesign how things work internally so that you can take advantage of the of the parallelism. Um, so I don't see much value in doing that particularly um, uh, for at least for composition. Now we might, for other things we might consider it like uh, drawing ends up, you know, anything graphics related obviously because the, these, these parallel operations were started in <laughs> graphics and then people realized you can use AI to do the same thing or you can use that same thing in AI. Um, Graphics ends up being a very, a very uh, uh, amenable to these kinds of things. But still, when we're talking about you know code that normal people write, it's very difficult to think about uh, sig you know significant parallel operations, and we don't have really the mental models yet to make that trivial. And so, you know, maybe at some point we get we get the mental models in place where we you know somebody comes up with a mental model to do programming that makes it so that you know that uh, parallel work is, is, is really easy. Uh, functional programming was an attack on, you know, was trying to do that. Turns out that functional programming, at least from my perspective, ends up being too difficult to do normal programming in. Um, so it's sort of like this trade-off. Uh, you're relying too much on the system being able to perform magic to make things uh, efficient. And, uh, and for me, the least functional programming ends up being difficult to make things actually work, work fast. Um, but it does allow you to work in parallel pretty easily because you're dealing with immutable values throughout the whole thing. So, um, but anyway, that's, it's in, until we get to a system where we say, yes, the industry says, this is the way you do, uh, multi-programming and, you know, parallel work and all that kind of stuff. And it, and it, and mortals can write it, then, then we'll consider <laughs> at some point taking advantage of it for a UI. Fair Thank enough. you for humoring me. <laughs> for, <laughs> well, that's that... good. No, it's a good question. So um, um, I would say let's go to the next question from the slide. Yes. We're actually the next two, the most upvoted are kind of two faces of the same metal. And I'm afraid, Chuck, that as always, as everyone that works on the Compose team gets asked when they come here, is is there any plan to rename <laughs> the, the Compose <laughs> runtime and the Compose UI to, to clearly uh, separate them. And I, I, I know, the, you know that, <laughs> that ship has sailed. Um, you know, it's, it, it, I, you know, I, we, we had internal discussions about it. Um, it's, it's right now I've gotten used to it. Uh, it's uh, the, clearly in the document area, clearly if you look at the design of compose, there's a central core, which the runtime is at MPP. It's basically, 
Uh, it's multi-platform in its, in its design and its implementation. Um, there are no Android dependencies within uh, the core runtime. Um, it, is, it is pure in that regard. Um, and it can be used in a bunch of different contexts. So, so just doing that, uh, that's our first step. So when you talk about the, Android, the, the, the Jetpack Compose runtime itself, um, there's nothing that depends upon anything outside of itself. It's, it's pretty self-contained. Um, it does have some uh, usage of, of immutable uh, collections for the snapshot system. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, it's, 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 that's the only real dependency it has. And that's fairly simple to get an MPP. The, the, those, those libraries exist on, on all the platforms that Kotlin targets today. Um, and so from, from that perspective, it's, it's very isolated. Then on top of that is the UI system, which depends upon you know, being able to draw graphics and somehow and get events. Uh, but otherwise, it's actually not that dependent upon uh, Android it, it itself. It's, it's pretty MVP. Um, and then layered on top of that is all the, the you know, the pieces of, of Compose that are necessary for interacting with, an, uh, with Android itself. So you, the Android view or the, compose, the composable Android view is, is really our attachment into the system. Um, and it allows us to grab a surface and draw on it, as well as get events. And so you can imagine then this being used in multiple contexts. And in fact, JetBrains has done that. Uh, they've created a version of Compose that works on the desktop that just targets uh, Skia directly. Um, and so it's drawing on, on a surface uh, directly in multiple windows and all that kind of stuff. So, so from our, I mean, I, from the name perspective, I think that ship has sailed unless there's some language feature that allows us to easily rename uh, packages. I don't know if you've ever been in a scenario where you had to rename a package in Java. It's not pleasant. Um, and uh, in, from a compatibility standpoint, it's just not a service that you would want to, it's not a good, good thing to do to your customers. Um, it's not something that we would we would uh, want to inflict on anyone. So there would have to be some underlying renaming dynamically or by the compiler that would have to come in before we would actually even consider such a thing. Uh, I guess on the kind of on the other side uh, of like the other face of the of this metal would be uh, the follow up question, which was uh, why isn't the snapshot system a standalone library? It kind of is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we talked about that a couple of times. The snapshot system can be independent um, and probably should be. Um, and uh, we might at some point move it out. It won't change its namespace, but it will be a separate library that you can depend upon outside of the Compose library. And that's certainly a change we want to make. Um, it, that allow you to make it, you know, if you can make an independent model system based upon snapshots that has nothing to do with Compose, um, or you can test independently of any Compose library. Um, and that would be very useful. Uh, and so we'll probably do that. Uh, it, we should have done that at the beginning. That's we talk about regrets. That's one of them. But that that's something we can forget. We can we can fix because you can split packages. You just can't change the what the what the name of the contents are. Um, there's another question just came up. Uh, rose through the ranks quite quickly. I don't know if how much your domain is it, but uh, someone's asking uh, if there's any chance that the composable preview. Uh, will ever be as fast as uh, previous for XMLs because right now it's just faster to run the app than to build yeah. the, the previews. Yeah, I mean we're we're working on that internally. That's one of the things that we don't have anything that we can discuss. I mean that's definitely we we hear all of that uh, and we're working on ways of improving that internally. And you might see something uh, in in the next year that 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 improves that, uh, but. It's, it's something that we need to make sure we get right. Uh, we've, we've made, in the Android team, we've made attempts at doing things faster in the past uh, that weren't exactly right. Uh, we don't want to repeat those mistakes with the new system. Uh, we want to make sure that we get it right. And there's a lot of things we need to do between now and when. I mean, you want the previous system to be fast, but you also don't, don't want it to tear down Android Studio every 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, so you, you, there's other things that we need to do. You also need to, to like be somewhat reasonable, uh, handle like air conditions that you type. You know, if you do it, do an infinite loop in the middle of your loop, you shouldn't hang Android Studio. 
um, things like that. So it's like there's there's a various things that we need to do to to make it more robust uh, because it'll be executing code that you haven't finished writing yet. Um, and in that that case, it's like well, you know, we want to show it, but what do we do when you essentially destroyed everything? Um, <laughs> and how do we recover from it? But, um, so that's that's the, the, we're working on that. So that's that's definitely one of the lines of, of effort that that we're working on, but we don't have anything that we can we can talk about. Kind of related to that, um, can you shed any light? I don't know if it's your work or someone else's, but can you shed any light on how uh, live literal works? Because that's yeah, kind so of live literal dark was magic. our first attempt. Um, and essentially, that's where derived state of actually came about. It's because we needed it for live literals. Oh, okay. Um, so Leland basically came and came, you know, talked to me. He goes, you know, what I really want is, <laughs> and so we ended up talking about uh, live literals, uh, and then how derived state of would be a good, you know, good thing to have, and we probably should make it general, and then, and then next was it, well, it should only be a, invalidated when it changes, right? And and so. The, um, so they kind of got it life as its own, but live, uh, derived state of actually came about uh, because of live literals and and live literals are essentially just turning all strings into a mutable state of. Um, that's essentially what it does. And so it re the compiler rewrites it to a mutable state of and then uh, the IDE will send changes as you make them into the editor um, and will update the mutable state of and then recomposition happens normally like it was any other mutable state object and you see it on the screen uh, immediately. And that's our first attempt. Um, turns out that, that, that live literals were not good enough. Um, you, you want to be able to, you, you want to make structural changes in the code. Uh, you want to add a row or column, or you want to uh, add a modifier, remove a modifier. Um, those changes can't be made, uh, or live literals can't help you. And so the next step is to obviously do something uh, more dramatic, you know, try and see if we can, yeah. Something yeah, like state. Uh, hot reload in Flutter, somewhat along those yeah, lines. Yeah, yeah, something like something like hot reload, uh, like doing something similar to that, uh, is is what we're looking at. Uh, you know how we do it, how Kotlin does it. Um, I mean, Java doesn't. In general, Java doesn't uh, have built-in support for this kind of thing, so it's not like we're appealing to some underlying uh, system that Java has uh, into it in it. Uh, we have to invent a bunch of things, so mm. um, so we're we're in the process of doing that. It's 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 challenging. The, the challenging part is not to get the the cases that work well working. The challenging part is getting all the stuff that people actually do working. And so we're we're going to take our time. Make sure and people do weird stuff. <laughs> yeah, and we need to make sure we don't like I say we don't take down the Android Studio when you do it. Um, yeah. So that's. And we actually need to make sure we produce the correct result and not just something, right? Um, yeah. It, it should be what you type, not just something that we happen to display because we, we got confused. Um, so there's that too. So. Well, good luck. Uh, I, <laughs> I think every everyone, everyone here and everyone that is not here as well is kind of like fingers crossed rooting for you folks. <laughs> it's like, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's. I, I did something similar. I mean, to, to do this kind of thing, I did. I, I for, I wrote the JavaScript IntelliSense engine for Visual Studio when I was at Microsoft. Um, so that when you did IntelliSense for, uh, for JavaScript for quite a number of years, you were using the engine that I wrote. And essentially, what I did was some of these techniques for JavaScript. I actually just executed the JavaScript. Um, to see what the result was. So if the result of the expression was a string, I showed you string me members. If the result ex expression was some object that had members, I, I showed that. Um, so there's definitely some techniques that we can use uh, that are similar to what the techniques I used in that system uh, to prevent crashes, because it's the same problem. You're right in the middle of writing JavaScript and you say dot and the code might have an infinite loop. Um, so what do you do? Uh, and so that's that we can use some of those same techniques. So it's 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 a problem that we can solve. It's just that we just need to do it. Well, yeah. fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's another question that I think you also have something interesting to to talk about, which is the uh, tips for programmer productivity. What would you tell your young self to learn or unlearn? Yeah. Well, the uh, 
it, 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 interesting. I think I sent you a, a link to a yep. blog post that I wrote at one point. My blog has is, is, is long since been retired, but uh, I kept the source around in a GitHub, in a GitHub repository. Um, and I, I wrote it in 2005, so it was quite, quite dated at this point. Uh, but basically, it, it was I wrote it when I knew that my kids weren't going to be programmers, um, or when they told me they weren't, uh, in no uncertain terms, <laughs> that they weren't going to be. Uh, eventually, one of my children did become a programmer, so it's 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 a little dated in that regard. But uh, but this is the advice I would have given them at the beginning of their career. And the the there really is uh, essentially a few. Uh, I th there are six primary tips. One of them is to keep learning. Is that any any programmer? You just need to be voracious, voracious about the things that you learn about. Um, like, for example, who would have known that learning about databases and how transactions work in databases would help a UI? Right? You don't know. I mean, it was something I was interested in. I was always like fascinated about how databases work, and it was all of a sudden I said, "Oh, wait, I can do this in memory." Um, that it clicked and said, "Oh, there's a snapshot system to be to be done like an in-memory database." And, and you get notifications and you can do equivalents of, you know, on commit transactions and stuff like that. So um, that's what essentially observability is, is you can think of it as a commit, a commit hook um, on a transaction that causes the UI to be recalculated. Um, and that's, that's kind of the same principle. Um, learn to communicate. I mean, you guys do a good job of that. Uh, so that's, you know, doing things like being able to communicate on a stream or being able to do a presentation uh, to a group of people is something that's important. Uh, otherwise, your ideas will sit in your head and never be, nobody will ever know uh, what they are. Um, you need to be able to, uh, that's the primary thing I need to learn. I mean, I'm not very good at communicating. Uh, that's a thing that I have to work on all the time. Uh, be predictable. Um, the other one is like, you know, someone tell you, you tell somebody it's going to take two weeks, it, make sure it takes two weeks or less. Um, ish. <laughs> ish. Yeah. I mean, this is really hard for us as an industry. We, we tend to like underestimate the work that we do, but being predictable yeah. is, is important because people rely on the work that you do. Um, or if you can't predict it, be honest. Uh, that, that's, you know, saying, ah, this is too, you know, I don't know. I have no idea. It might take a month. Um, and just be, be honest about it. So people don't make hard dependencies. Oh, you know, Jim told me he's going to be done in five, in five weeks and he's not done yet. Um, that's, you know, you don't want those kinds of things. Um, the other one is to, this is important, I think, is own up to your own mistakes. Um, this is, this is something I've learned in my career is that your mistakes will find you out. Um, and so own up to them. <laughs> oh, mamma mia. <laughs> yeah, this is oh, even oh, before that's, I worked that's... at Google. Uh, uh, Google. Google has a, a process called an, uh, a blameless postmortem. Um, so basically, uh -huh. when something bad happens, you write about what bad happens, even if you're responsible for it. It doesn't matter from Google's perspective. What matters is that, OK, what happened? What are we going to do about it? And how do we prevent it from happening in the future? And so even though you did it, it's from Google's perspective. It's not that it it's the fact that it could be done at all is the problem. It's not the fact that you did it. It's like, how do we make it so that doesn't happen anymore? And that's what the blameless, you know, the the the. The blameless postmortem is about is that is really discovering what the flaws are in the process, not the person. Um, because people are going to be fallible, no matter how good you are, you're going to make a mistake. Um, and so that's the that's the thing about you know owning up to your mistakes and 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 when you're dealing with them as a group, don't blame anybody. It's like it's not Bob's fault. It's that you know it's the system's fault that Bob could do it. Um, so if he could make a mistake like this. Or maybe it's a risk you want to take. Like it's okay that Bob made that mistake because the chances that Bob will make that mistake again are low enough to where it's not worth putting a system in place to prevent it. That's a perfectly valid result of a postmortem. It's just like, well, we just take that risk because trying to prevent it is actually more costly than than the, than the thing that happened. Um, and so, you, but basically, you need to own up. You made a mistake. Try not to do it again. Um, also, to try not to let bad code off your desk. This is where unit tests come in. This is something that, I mean, if you look at Delphi when I wrote it a long time ago, not a not a unit test to be found. <laughs> there's there's no unit tests in, in the VCL. <laughs> 
it was a uh, our unit test was essentially well does the IDE still work great okay we're we're going we're going um, <laughs> and because we used the VCL to write the IDE and so you know that was our test um, and uh, but after after a long time in the industry the unit tests I've I've learned to love uh, and uh, if you look at the compose uh, you'll see that there are lots of unit tests about everything um, and my process for unit tests is especially when I get a bug report is I. I look at the bug report, I figure out what's going on by reproducing it. Um, whatever we, in whatever context the person gave it to me. Um, once I reproduce it, I try and understand it, what went wrong. And then I write a unit test that reproduces the problem. It says, okay, this is what went wrong. This is a unit test that produces the exact problem the user produced. Then I fix it. The unit test passes, hopefully. <laughs> and then I check in both of them at the same time um, after I validated that the original problem was fixed because I might have, you know, in this process, I might have misdiagnosed the actual problem. Uh, never happens to me. Uh, happens to other people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, well, maybe I should own up to my mistake there. Yes, it's happened. <laughs> um, the other one is that uh, the, the last one is, is programming is fun. I don't know if you, you guys, that programming is fun. Uh, Releasing stuff is, is not. <laughs> um, I, I wrote it in the context of shipping because at the point there was not, you know, CI and CD and people releasing everything. And, uh, and so the industry has changed. Um, but the idea that shipping a product is actually not very fun at all. Um, I, I, I talk about it as, as it feels good, like when someone stops hitting you. <laughs> and that's essentially what... what um, what shipping is like, but it's your job, right? It's your job is not to program. Your job is to ship things um, and, and to get it to your customers and to take advantage and, and to look out for the people using your code and to be responsive to bug reports and to produce you know, fixes in a re timely fashion. That's your job. Uh, programming is fun. Uh, doing that is not, but you should be good at your job, which is, which is shipping code. Um, and, and not get distracted by the fun part. Like you should, like that, that means that you're, it doesn't mean that you have to be a drudgery all the time. You need to make your job pleasant um, and fun to do, but you need to realize that the end result is not, you know, code that's, that you ship, checked in. The end result is someone using it um, and to do useful work. And so that's, that's what you need to make sure happens. Um, but that's essentially it. Uh, I think that that covers it. Um, yeah, those are the things. I don't think I had to. I think the one thing I had to unlearn was the, like you said, cowboy programming. Um, it's fun to do. It's it's very productive. <laughs> well, I, I, I was I was kidding, but that was you know what the, that was the idea. I worked in that kind of scenarios where you know there was no testing and it's just YOLO. You yeah, just yeah. throw it on the Play Store and but but we can do better now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can do better now. And 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 I've learned my lesson. Like you see in, in Compose, there's there's a lot of work I put into making sure that when I make a change to Compose, that it doesn't slow it down, it doesn't uh, create bugs, and you know, it's, so there's a lot of effort we go into to make sure that doesn't that that when we produce a new release, that it's better than the previous one. Um, and that's that's important. And part of that is unit testing and making sure that. Uh, not, I mean, the, the nice thing about doing the, the model I have of, you know, reproducing it as a unit test and checking in both of them at the same time, it's not unique to me, but it's the one that I, I've kind of grown, grown to like, um, is that it's, it's a built-in regression test. You know that if I refactor something, I'm not going to run into the same problem again. Um, mm. and, uh, and I have that there as a backstop. So it's, it's really nice. So unit testing, I think, is, is probably the biggest change I made in my entire career was the, the love of doing unit testing. I don't quite do TDD. Um, I, I kind of deviate between it, uh, that and just normal code, but, but, uh, but sometimes I will, I will. Like for example, uh, movable content up, I did the unit test before I wrote the code, which is what unusual for me. Um, but every time I design something, I always do the, the spirit of TDD, I think is, um, the spirit of TDD is to start with the result and to work backwards. Now tests kind of enforce you to do that, but I've always done that from the perspective of any design. I always work backwards from what I want to see. So I'll write something on the screen, I'll write some code, um, and then I will try and figure out how to get that code to work. Because this is what I want the user to be able to type. 
Um, and this is what I want them to be able to do. And that's what we did for Compose too. We just, we started off with, we want someone to be able to write this code. This is the code that we want them to write. How does that work? And, uh, and so what we did is we started off with the code um, and we started off with a runtime that kind of worked. And then over time, I developed a runtime that made it actually work. Um, and then I worked on a runtime that made it work fast because uh, my first runtime was, was pretty slow. Um, and then, you know, that's the process that we, that I, I've developed over time of the way you work is that you just, you start with the end result, you work backwards from there. Um, and then you, and TDD kind of enforces that, but, you know, sometimes I don't need it. I don't need that, that crutch to do it. Um, I just naturally do it. So it's, it's not a, it's not something that I needed to have a development style do. Um, but TDD is, is great. If you don't, if you don't do it naturally, then I would recommend you do TDD because it forces you to think about what the user of your API must call, must do. And, and that's important. It's not, you're not just delivering for functionality, you're delivering a, someone actually has to use the API you design. Um, if you're just exposing some internal data structures, that's just not good. You need to start with the shape of what the API should look like from the user's perspective. And, and the first way to do it is just write some code that uses it. Um, just what does the code look like that would use this? Um, this is how Delphi started, for example, a long time ago when I, you know, when I was a kid, when I was like younger than you guys are now. Um, the we, you know, Anders and I just started off with on a whiteboard. We wrote, you know, button dot text equals, you know, click, uh, or you know, colon equals click. Uh, it was Pascal. So, um, and we said, well, how do we get that to work? Because you know, you have to call set text at some point uh, on the on the uh, on the text or the text control. And we just kind of figured out what that would mean. Uh, that implied some changes to the, to the language. We had to add properties. Um, and then we, we wanted to do, okay, what if you clicked it, what happened? So we had to add events. And so we added events. And so it became that perspective. We wrote some code on the board and we tried to make it work. And at the re end result, we got Delphi. Um, that and that's the, uh, and that's the thing, the thing that we that we do in uh, in Compose as well. Is we just write things and say this is the way we think it should work. Um, we kind of discuss it internally, and then we go implement it once we've we, we decided that that's the way it should look. And we might change our minds later and do some tweaking, but and then, but essentially it starts off with design from the user's perspective, and and then work backwards. I I, I like this approach actually. Uh, I saw something similar. There was a, um, uh, a talk by Adi Sebastiano. He was explaining uh, domain-specific languages uh, or how you build your own DSL with Kotlin. And he was basically doing something like that, right? I, I would like to, to type this thing. And then inside this block, I would like to type these other things. And, you know, and he was like, okay, now what? Everything is red. How do I do it? You know, and he starts building like alt enter kind of thing. So you know, create a function that does this, and step by step, eventually he he made yeah, exactly. it compile, and that's it, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it's a little more. Uh, yeah, that's a good example of of, of starting. It's like I wanted I want to be able to write this. I want this to work. Um, uh, DSLs are a good example of of things that you want. I want to be able to just say this without having to know you know exactly how it works and. And, and Compose is a lot like that. Is I want to be able to say that I want you know I want a row that contains three text boxes and a and a button at the bottom. And when I click the button, it does something. You you don't want to have to get involved in the process of how does that actually get on the screen. You want to be able to say it. This is what I want. And that's 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 essentially the way Compose works as well. Is we wanted to say this, and we wanted this result. Um, and some of the fundamental things we I mean if you look at uh, some other similar frameworks, you look at React or Flutter or they have these, you know, you construct these complicated expressions that the result of the expression is your user interface. Um, and they're limited in the in what they can say uh, within an expression. I mean, you can only use, you know, the ternary operator or something equivalent to do if then, and you have to use map and, and for each. And in other words, you're running, you're using different constructs that you would normally use. Uh, you're, you're, you're writing things as expressions, um, which are fine, but, but it would be nice if you could just use a for loop or, or, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. And so that's why we decided to use um, the, the mental model for how Compose works is actually, uh, is actually mon is monadic uh, in its nature. And 
Uh, monads are a really difficult concept to, to describe to someone, so I don't usually use it. Um, but fundamentally, the fundamental principle behind, uh, behind Compose is that composition is a monadic expression that's passed in as a parameter to your function. Um, and you're building this monad as you construct it. Um, and so if you look in, in how ML or basically Haskell works with monads and how the IO system works inside of Haskell, you can notice that there's a lot of parallels to how Compose works. Um, when you get a, you know, an IO monad inside of, inside of Haskell, you write to this, you write to the monad. Well, from Haskell's perspective, it's all immutable. You haven't done anything. There's no side effects, but the side effects are encapsulated in the monad, right? So the monad will, the value you pass to the next expression contains the effect of the right. And that's essentially what you think about in composition is that the effect of composition is being passed in as a parameter and you're updated as you execute. And the only side effect that you should have uh, in composition is the side effect encapsulated by the composition. You shouldn't do anything outside. This goes into one of the other questions that are on Soldo, which is what the reason why you have side effect and what do you use? Well, side effect is exactly what it says on the, on the label. It's, it's something you put in that's a side effect of, of, of composition that you want only to be done if composition succeeds. Um, and you want it to be done when all the other side effects of composition are visible. And so you don't want to do it during composition because that might shift around in time. You want it to make sure it happens when everything else happens. Um, so for example, if you're changing the color of the window that's holding the composition, you're going to do that in a side effect so that the color changes when everything else changes, not in the same frame as everything else, not when, not some, you know, three frames earlier um, when composition was done. And so that's, that's the reason why we have side effects to begin with is that it encapsulates everything within the composition uh, as a side effect uh, of composition. And so everything is encapsulated within the composition function and never nothing ever escapes. Now we can't enforce that. I mean, that's the Kotlin doesn't allow us to enforce those rules, but that's the essential mental model you should come in with composition is that when you run a composition function, nothing's happened until we say it's okay, right? So you can do composition and nothing should affect anything outside. The snapshot system guarantees that that happens for any um, snap or mutable snaps or mutable state of. So any mutable state of no changes to the mutable state of will be visible to any other snapshot until composition lands and everything is seen at the same time mm -hmm. in the same frame. So, so that's the, that's the reason why we have side effects is that you, we might back out. Like there are certain cases for which composition will not apply, and and you don't want the side effect to to be in a, to be there if the side of, if the composition is discarded. So that would be, for example, something like you you have a speculative execution of the composition, right? And then for whatever reason, it gets cancelled. Maybe because you're going back to what you were saying earlier. Maybe you are trying to anticipate. The, the recomposition in the previous frame, and then at some point that that during the, the the time interval of that frame, some of the state changes. So you need to redo the composition, something along those lines. Yeah, I mean, here's an example. I mean, you're running an animation, and the animation is is merely going along, and we're precomposing the animation to make sure that we get the right the right data. And then when the snapshot comes in, we realize that that uh, that value in the snapshots no longer used um, that you've you've completed the navigation for which mm -hmm. the navigate the animation was the the pacifier for and so what do you do with the changes made to that animation uh, well they're gone we don't use them um, and so if if that was making changes to some global state uh, if it's done in side effect then those global state changes are not applied either they're gone but if he did it immediately, then those global state changes are present, even though the composition that produced them has, has been thrown away. And so it's it's important that we that for side effects they land in a timely fashion. They line they land when all the other changes are there, and they only land when the changes apply. So that's that's the reason why side effects is there. There's other things like you know launch effect and other things that use side effect systems. Uh, and and memorization and things like or you know the the remember object. To do certain other, you know, intelligent things like it cancels the the coroutine scope 
if the composition is no longer used. So you can freely just start a composition that has a you know an infinite loop in it, uh, or a coroutine that has an infinite loop in it, and you and you know normally you look at that and you go, wow, that's never going to end. But you know that when that that composable is no longer part of the composition, it's going to be cleaned up for you. So that's kind of nice. It's that, um, and that's you know if you look at the way we do, uh, we we translate events. Uh, our event listeners, if you, the complicated ones, they start a coroutine and they just you know they they pretend like they're infinitely going to be listening to the stream of events and they translate them into actions. That's that's fine to do because. Essentially, we know that, that if you're no, if that component that's listening to the event or the modifier that contains that is no longer used, that that coroutine is, is canceled and cleaned up. Thank so you. One less thing to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, we try. This is the case where it says, okay, when this 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 is, you know, we we did this. That we had this process of what does coroutines mean in composition, and we had this discussion. It's like, oh well, coroutines should be. We should create a coroutine scope that's scoped to the composition, and when the composition, you know, so we had all these things about how do you do it, um, stuff like that. So yeah, it's it was it was fun doing the design. That was from my perspective. Going back to the advice is that definitely start from the end and work backwards is one of the things that you can that will always serve you well uh, when you do when you do uh, an application. It also allows you to figure out what you don't have to do, which is the hardest thing uh, in programming. Is figuring out what doesn't have to be done, and that's uh, that's also nice. Is that if you start from the end, you know that the things that you that if as long as it delivers to what you're going, then you're fine. If it does something that doesn't accomplish the end result, then you shouldn't do it at all. Thank you like like a it. lot. Uh, it's been <laughs> super super interesting, and I I would keep talking with you for hours, but I, I don't I also don't want to steal your whole day. Um, that's okay. <laughs> But on the other hand, if you want to come back anytime, I'd love to have you again. Uh, it's been a great, great, great stream. And I'm super glad to have had you here. So, I mean, well, thanks for having me. To say, I, mean, I like talking about this stuff. You, I could wax poetic for hours as well. Um, but, you know, people get tired of listening to me after a while. So. Uh, no, no, no. Let's, let's, say, <laughs> let's say you want to explain <laughs> movable content to somebody that yeah. doesn't get it, right? I mean, let's, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, hypothetical, right? Asking I mean, for a friend. Thing comes, <laughs> yeah, asking for a friend. friend. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we can go into the details of how movable content works at some point when I land it. Um, uh, Counting on it. <laughs> and uh we can uh, maybe we can have Doris come on too because she'll she's doing yeah. all the animation stuff. It's it's sort of yeah. a building block to uh, to hero transitions and shared element shared shared element transitions. So um, she's doing all the hard work <laughs> of getting it to look nice. I just do the infrastructure to say you know I give her the tools to do it, um, and then she has to actually do it. So um, yeah, she's, so maybe uh, we can come on together and and, and talk yeah yeah it. absolutely. We we would love to have her back. Um, so. As like as even knows, yeah. uh, animations are one of my favorite things. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I come it's to the conclusion the that you know I, I report to Adam, uh, who reports to Ramon, right? But I actually work for Doris. So that's, that's my job. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so. he has the most demanding use cases, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you know, my job is to make Doris stuff work. Um, that's basically, <laughs> that's my job. The fancy stuff. The fancy stuff. We need yeah, more fancy, fancy stuff. stuff. Yeah, like so I work. I work for Doris. Um, and uh, yeah, it's fun. It's I, I love it. I, it's just like great, great having someone drive the use cases, and you know exactly what you need to do. Nice, Ivan. Shall we Beautiful. give away some stickers? Well, it's it's a it's a it's a just weird to finish episode. it off. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a weird episode because we we haven't had much. Uh, engagement in the chat because people are, were very focused on the on the, <laughs> on the on the waterfall of information that came from Chuck and it looks like nobody wants stickers today. So okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> we have more for next time, I guess. <laughs> we have we have definitely more stickers. Uh, I want to remind you that this episode VOD. Uh, ah. Oh yeah, Maya, that, that was a good one. Well played. So let's run the <laughs> Let's run the giveaway. Let's run the giveaway. <laughs> Let's see who's gonna win the stickers today. Um, Can't wait. Um, no, 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 no. 
Maya, great, that was awesome. Thank you, Maya, for playing with us and getting stickers. Uh, jokes aside, um, this episode is going to be available on YouTube tomorrow, as usual, has our VODs, and we are going to also run the IntelliJ um, license giveaway on this VOD. So keep an eye on Twitter and uh, let's win all the stuff. Um, <laughs> I love this. It was so yeah. much stuff, Chuck. I mean, the work that you are doing is crazy. I mean, like in a, in a very loving, crazy way, because <laughs> for me, it's incredible. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is... Well, thanks you is... guys for having me on. I enjoyed it. <sighs> okay. Uh, so before we go, uh, just want to remind everyone, the new stickers are uh, on the coffee shop, if you want them. Uh, and uh, also... Uh, there's going to be, because that's what we do uh, by now is like a tradition almost, uh, we do thumbnails for YouTube that are extremely clickbaity. So after we're <laughs> offline in a minute or two, uh, if you're a Twitch sub subscriber, you can join us on our Discord server or if you uh, are a member on Coffee or on YouTube, uh, join us there and we're going to do it live, <laughs> privately. Uh, but we did it first time last Sunday and we had a lot of fun. So join us. Uh, I think that's all and we're going to see you on Sunday. Oh yeah, we have a, yes. we have a, oh, before we go, I, I meant to say that, uh, if you like, uh, the, um, uh, the compose internal stuff, there's a book you can read. We're not sponsored. It's just a good friend of ours and the book is super interesting. So you can uh, read the Compose Internals book uh, by our friend uh, Jorge. And uh, it's super, super interesting. We've mentioned it before when, um, when Leland joined us. Uh, Leland also helped proofreading some part of it, I think. So yeah, it's... Yeah, it's... Leland and I both helped, helped proofread ah. sections of that book. So I, I, I proofread the snapshot system uh, part of the of the internal so so that one you know much of the topics that I covered today were, were dealt in that were very appropriate <laughs> and uh, nice. thank you Chuck for that as well and uh, yeah uh, we're gonna see you uh, everyone on yeah <laughs> even what are you doing <laughs> we're no, gonna I'm see just you showing all... the stickers yeah fine. See you all on uh, Sunday. So uh, Sunday we have Manuel Vivo, and we're going to be talking about the architecture guide because there's like you, you might have seen it was released uh, on developer.android.com back in December. There was a lot of discussion online, and we have Manuel here with us. So we're going to bring your questions because that's the right time to ask them because he's the one who wrote it. So. <laughs> See you all on Sunday. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Chuck, and thanks to everyone that joined us today. Bye. Ciao. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you.